I just would like to say uh, hello and welcome uh, to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy that you're joining us tonight for our event, uh, Racism and Fascism, a Love Story. My name is uh, Katja Donovan. I'm the executive director at 1014. And I really wholeheartedly uh, like to say hi and thanks for coming to 1014 tonight. So 1014, for those who don't know us yet, uh, we provide a space for ideas, a place for a dialogue across the Atlantic. Uh, we tackle current topics and bring, it, uh, bring a transatlantic perspective to that. And of course, the humanities are one of these big, important topics. So this event tonight is in partnership with the De Gruyter Foundation, and it kicks off a whole entire series, uh, Humanities for Humans. We'll have uh, eight events over the course of two years, and uh, I would really like to thank the De Gruyter Foundation with three representatives here tonight for this incredible partnership uh, on this super important topic. Also, my thanks go to Professor Irene Karkandis, who is a board member basically since we founded 1014 and has done an incredible job sort of supporting 1014, uh, shaping uh, what we're doing, shaping our mission and vision. And she came up with this idea and said, wow, you know, there are two organizations and I think they should meet and I think we can pull this off. Uh, so she initiated, initiated this, uh, this wonderful series and now she, she not only did that, but she also agreed to curate and moderate that series. So thank you very much to Irene, thank you very much to the De Gruyter Foundation and thank you very much to all of you, of course, for coming tonight and for, um, yeah, uh, taking part in this in this first discussion. So with that, I hand it over to Myrto from the De Gruyter Foundation. She flew in from Germany today to be with us. Uh, and with that, Myrto, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Katja, dear Irene, our dear speakers, our dear guests, my name is Myrto Aspioti, and I'm an editor at the De Gruyter Publishing House in Berlin. I'm here today to greet you on behalf of Manuela Gerloff, who is uh, our Vice President for the Humanities and Social Sciences, and who could not be here with us today, but who looks forward to addressing you at the next conversation in May. I'm also standing here on behalf of the Walter de Gruyter Foundation, a not-for-profit organization whose aim is to promote research and support exceptional scholarship, especially in the humanities. The De Gruyter Foundation's endowment comes from the publishing house, which has existed under various imprints for over 270 years. In former iterations, De Gruyter first published original works by key figures in German letters, such as the brothers Grimm, Immanuel Kant, and Friedrich Nietzsche. Walter de Gruyter, the founder of the press as we know it today, was himself a distinguished medievalist. The press's commitment to the humanities is therefore as deep as its history is long. In the last decades, we have aimed to reach an even wider global public. Our New York office opened over half a century ago to promote transatlantic scholarly exchange. In fact, I'm very happy that Mr. Steve Fallon, Vice President Americas, um, is here with us today. Steve. Steve. Today, about 50% of de Groter's list is published in English, and we are proud to count some of North America's best scholars amongst our authors. With this new initiative, we want to create a space for critical discourse on the premise that the humanities are not only still relevant, but crucial to our collective and individual lives as humans. We are very grateful to our partners at 1014, Katja Donovan and Benjamin Bergner, for their support in implementing Humanities for Humans, as well as to the advi Initiative's Advisory Board and our guest speakers, who gener generously offer their time and expertise to this project. Our debt of gratitude to Irene Kakandis is immense, not only for curating and moderating the series of events, but for conceptualizing it in the first place. By lucky coincidence, Irene, who is the editor of one of um, our important book series at the Publishing House, is also on 1014's advisory board. We are very grateful that she advocated for this initiative, brought the two organizations together, and enthusiastically helped bring Humanities for Humans to fruition. Without further ado, I would like to pass on the floor to Irene and to our guests. Thank you very much for being here. So, Shana Tova, Happy New Year to everyone who is celebrating. And if you're not celebrating, please do celebrate. Um, New Year's are always important. 
Um, thank you, Mirto. Thank you, Katya. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, I know that you know I have huge thanks to both organizations who have made my life so rich and for um, specifically funding uh, this idea of mine. Um, I also want to thank the members of the board. We have a small um, advisory board of Humanities for Humans. I don't believe any of them are here, but if I didn't see you, please raise your hand. Okay, but we uh, thank them. And um, I especially want to thank each one of you audience members for coming and demonstrating that there does exist a curiosity about the humanities and what the humanities can do for humans. So um, thank you very much for being here. In proposing this series, I wanted to bring humanities scholars and hu humans in general together because <laughs> while I believe that humanistic study is vital to our survival, the humanities fields are indeed under assault in this country and in other places in the world like Great Britain where whole departments are being eliminated by college administrations and overall enrollments in humanities courses are declining. I just would share a really brief anecdote that last weekend at the German Studies Association, I saw a former student of mine who had a tenure track job at Pacific Lutheran. For those of you who don't know Pacific Lutheran, it was the home for, of, for many years of Christopher Browning, who is one of our most eminent scholars on the Holocaust. And yet they eliminated the German department wholesale despite his attempt to intervene. So this is something that's happening and and I hope uh, we can fight against this kind of thing. The humanities, as we are considering them in this series, include a very large range of fields that study the arts, literature, music, philosophy, religion, and of course, different aspects of human life. Humanities scholars, to put it otherwise, have developed methods and concepts to help us better understand human behavior, human organization, human action of all kind, including creative action in the past and in the present. Please just come right on in. This is very informal. Welcome. Precise verbal expression, orally and in writing, are hallmarks of humanities fields. As teachers, we strive to help our students learn how to think not what to think, as we are sometimes accused of, and how to then best express their own thoughts to others. In Germany and some other places, there's a strong tradition of humanities scholars as public intellectuals who are given space to share their views in venues like print journalism and radio. That's not been so much the case here in the United States. Therefore, one goal of this series is simply to give airtime to some really smart people like the two individuals who are sitting up here with me. To be sure, another goal is to discuss some concepts that come out of the humanities that have been accidentally or quite intentionally misrepresented to the general public, often as tools in the so-called culture wars. Examples would include critical race theory and white privilege, both originating within the academy and passing into the public sphere in ways that didn't reflect well the analytical work that they were originally coined to do. Now, some of you know that the name Irene means peace. It's been a little bit of a burden my whole life. I'm not such a peaceful person as I wish I were, but for sure, I don't want wars of any kind. So I'm not interested in the cultural wars per se. What I'm interested in is creating conversation. And we're calling these gatherings conversations, not just because there will be two experts sitting here who will exchange ideas with each other, but also because we want this to be a conversation with you. Right. So let's um, mention briefly again, uh, there will be eight conversations over two years, um, four for this year, four for next year. Um, we have an event in May and I hope she won't get mad at me, but one of our speakers is here. Uh, Mariana Hirsch, could you please just raise your hand or just so people can see you? Um, 
I'm very excited that Mariana will be speaking with another dear friend and colleague, Hortense Spillers, on repair, reparation, and refusal, and that will be on May 10th. So that's already on the 1014 uh, website. There are two other conversations in planning. One is trying to understand better why inequality is growing at the present time, and the other is what the humanities have to say about climate change. So, let's launch tonight's topic. And um, as I so love to do, I want to do that with a quote from a wonderful author, Junot Diaz. Race is a monstrous fiction. Racism, a monstrous crime. Just going to repeat that, it's so good. Race is a monstrous fiction. Racism, a monstrous crime, he said. This is a good moment to point you to the handout. Now, what would an event with professors be without a handout, right? I know you were all <laughs> hoping you might get a handout. Um, at number one on that handout, you're going to find an excellent introduction to the idea that there is no genetic basis for considering that there are different human races. If we think about race versus racism and take this one step further, I want to mention how these terms seem to be understood by the general public, at least as far as we can know that from some fairly sophisticated surveys. There was a German poll taken in spring of 2021 by a nonprofit organization there called the Racism Monitor. And this survey determined that 49% of the German population believe that something called race exists. Hmm, okay, that's worrisome when genetic scientists have been explaining to us for a while now that humans do not differ enough from one another to consider that there are different races of homo sapiens. On the other hand, and a little more positively, 90% of Germans recognize that racism exists in Germany. If we look at the US polls taken in the last approximately three years by reputable organizations like the Pew Research Foundation or the Gallup poll, you'll notice two interesting points of comparison. The question of the conceptual category of race is never interrogated directly in any of these polls as it was in the German polls. So, as far as I can uncover, we really don't know how many Americans are aware that genetics has long discredited the idea of different human races. To put it otherwise, the language of these polls poses questions as if black, white, Hispanic, Asian were indeed different human races. As for racism, well, Americans do believe that it exists but not nearly in the percentage as they do in Germany. And a much smaller percentage of American whites than blacks agree that people of color experience racism. Again, we do have some positive notes. A University of Massachusetts poll taken in December 2021 found out that 75% of respondents believe that teaching about racial inequality in schools is important. Tonight's topics are timely. There's the invasion of Ukraine, justified by the head of the Russian Confederation as a preemptive strike against Ukrainian fascists planning to invade Russia. There's the PBS series on America and the Holocaust that just aired last week in the New York area. And there are anti-immigrant far-right parties taking power as a result of recent Swedish and Italian elections. So without further ado, please let me introduce our speakers who can provide us with definitions of our key terms and elaborate on the relationship between racism and fascism in the past and in the present day. Dagmar Herzog is Distinguished Professor of History, Social Welfare, and Women's and Gender Studies at the Graduate School of the City University of New York. Professor Herzog is a prolific writer. To mention a few recent titles, um, the article On Being Adjacent to the Nazi Disability Murder Project, published to on E22, the edited volume, The Rutledge Companion, 
to Sexuality and Colonialism, 2021, and the monograph, Unlearning Eugenics, Sexuality, Reproduction, and Disability in Post-Nazi Europe, uh, 2018. Professor Herzog is currently at work on eugenic phantasms, a study of how a focus on theology and politics of disability in 20th century Germany changes how we think about racism and fascism alike. It is hard to turn the page. Um, Michael Hanchard is Gustav C. Krummerler Professor in the Africana Studies Department at the University of Pennsylvania, where he directs the Marginalized Populations Project. Among his many publications, let me please mention Orpheus and Power, the Movimento Negro of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, Brazil, 1945-1988, and The Specter of Race, How Discrimination Haunts Western Democracy, published by Princeton in 2018, which received the Ralph J. Bunch Award from the American Political Science Association among many other distinctions for that book and for Professor Hanchard, who recently was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is currently finishing a study called Fascism and Racism, a Love Story, from which he has let us borrow to organize our discussion tonight. Wonderful teachers, mentors, and colleagues, I've had the privilege of interacting with each of our distinguished scholars in reading and discussion groups where their erudition is matched by their clarity and passion. Dagmar Herzog, Michael Hanchard, welcome to 1014. Thank you so very much for helping us launch Humanities for Humans. Professor Herzog, may I ask you to offer some initial definitions and thoughts on our topic for this evening? Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. It's an enormous honor to be here. I'm very grateful and intimidated. It turned out not to be that easy at all to be the definitions person <laughs> starting out, but I'm going to try. Um, here we go. What is racism? Racism is prejudice, antagonism, repression directed at members of a group supposedly sharing inherited biological though sometimes just cultural characteristics, and deemed inferior and therefore not worthy of equal rights. Another way to say it might be, racism is a system of thought and feeling, and feeling emotion matters a lot, a framework for making sense of the world that has been evolved over centuries. It is rooted in a fiction, but it has a vast array of material consequences. Racism also seems to come in two main forms. There is an exterminatory exclusionist form. Think of settler colonialism, violence against indigenous peoples in North America, or think of Nazism's treatment of Jews or of Roma and Sinti. And there is a hierarchical exploitative form. So exterminatory versus exploitative, right? And key examples of the latter would be slavery, Jim Crow in the US South, apartheid in South Africa. And of course, there's overlap between the forms. Structural racism or systemic racism is a crucial manifestation, especially of the hierarchical exploitative form. Among other things, some examples of how it manifests in the United States. The long history of disenfranchisement at the voting booth, from terroristic violence to gerrymandering, voter suppression, and now also voter substitution. Dispossession of property through redlining, mortgage denial, and urban renewal, and then disinvestment, differential real estate valuing. The cultivation of systematic indebtedness, disproportionate incarceration rates, disinvestment in public schooling, the placement of zones of environmental hazard. In other words, racism shows up in politics, labor, housing, health, and education. What's fascism? The definitions circulating are never completely satisfactory. My definition involves a terroristic dictatorial regime crystallized around hostility to liberty, equality, fraternity, all three. And by fraternity, I mean also human capacities for empathy and solidarity. 
Fascism is deeply hostile to those. It is organized against those precious ideals. Fascism involves using the law against the rule of law. So it involves capturing the legal system so that legislatures and police and judges all enforce the regime's divisions between who is in and who is out, who is up and who is down. Fascism involves violence, persecution, removal from official positions, imprisonment, exile, execution of both political opponents and despised minorities. It involves all too often war against outside enemies, scorched earth, brutal counterinsurgency, lethal treatment of POWs. In general, a radicalization of colonialism's drive for conquest and exploitation. But fascism also involves knowledge control, propaganda, censorship, demand for public displays of enthusiasm, and inducements to denunciation by neighbors, coworkers, even family members. In other words, it's about turning citizens against each other. Fascism is both nostalgic and aspirational. It appeals to an imagined lost greatness. It promises a cleansing violence leading to renewal. It involves a nursing of grievances and resentments and stokes the fantasy of the group that wants to be dominant as pure and superior. So indoctrination is not so much into a clear set of ideas, but rather into the conviction of in-group superiority. There's also a sexual politics to fascism. Seeking control of reproduction, intruding into intimacies, persecuting sexual or gender minorities. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 were all about determining who could have sex with who and who could marry who, and calling into question the legal status of children of so-called mixed Jewish-Gentile marriages. More generally, all historical fascisms of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, can be recognized by the fact, like how do you recognize a fascism when you see one, by the fact that they were anti-abortion and anti-homosexual. And not least, fascism exploits the instability of truth. What counts as truth is always unstable and contested, but fascisms work that fact. There is a kind of ecstatic rejection of reason, a gleeful indulgence in making outrageous claims, a habit of inverting reality. Take it away, Thank Professor Hanchard. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Uh, it's a tough act to follow. Uh, thanks to Irene Kakandas for a generous invitation to share the stage with Destimal Dagmar Herzog and interact with the 1014 audience. I want to thank the DeGroyter Foundation and 1014 for hosting and sponsoring this event, and an appreciation for Katja Weisbrock Donovan, who helped coordinate event logistics. My brief comments are purposely provocative to generate discussion and audience engagement for my work in progress. Fascism, fascism and Racism, a Love Story, which focuses on the relationship between fascism and racial rule. While there has been a lot of talk and ink about fascism, authoritarianism, and their threats to democracy, racial rule has not gotten much attention in contemporary discourse. Racial rule, here I'm defining as the economic, political, and cultural domination of one group or another, over another, based upon perceived irreconcilable differences which provided justification for colonialism and conquest, enslavement, apartheid, and restrictive immigration policies, predates the rise of fascism in the 1920s. The 19th century scramble for Africa, the consolidation of Western economic and political dominance over colonized territories, set the terms for the proliferation of racial rule throughout the, the nation state system, the privileging of certain populations more suitable for citizenship and sovereignty than others. The Nazis, in fact, took many of the cues of racial for racial rule and subsequently fascism from the United States. Eugenics, apartheid, and coerced labor were all cribbed from the US federal and state law. Racial rule is the link connecting democracy and fascism as Western democracies extracted and exploited the many to protect and promote the few. Enzo Traverso, citing Theodore Adorno, noted the disquieting fact that the first fascist states of, of Europe emerged from within democratic polities, Spain, Italy, Germany. Robert Paxton, in his book, The Anatomy of Fascism, draws out the connection between fascism and racial rule by suggesting that, quote, 
The earliest phenomenon that could be functionally related to fascism is American, the Ku Klux Klan. The first version of the Klan in the defeated American South was arguably a remarkable preview of the fascist movements that would, that would have functioned into war Europe. It should not be surprising, after all, that the most precocious democracies, United States and France, should have generated precocious backlashes against democracy. Democracy's historical use of racial and ethnic national criteria to distinguish citizen from non-citizen is just as culpable as fascism in bringing several Western democracies, most notably the United States, to the precipice of civic implosion, which we're at right now. In the US, democratic and anti-democratic institutions and laws operated in the same polity and government. Jim Crow and Northern segregation are prime examples. What fascism and modern liberal democracies have shared is the perceived need to maintain ethno-national and other forms of hierarchy. Where fascism differs from racial rule is its emphasis on the need for demographic cleansing to maintain, although this is also incurred sometimes under racial rule, or restore a mythical national, race, national racial order of population homogeneity. This is where replacement theory, for example, part of the co contemporary rhetoric of the far right advocates in many countries comes in. Nowhere was the convergence of two distinct yet inrelated, interrelated political projects, fascism and racial rule, more apparent than in the January 6th insurrection and attack on the US Capitol. Many observers in the US and elsewhere considered the Ku Klux Klan, the Proud and Boogaloo Boys, and other organizational relics of a distant past or at best extremist fringe political movements. What many students of US politics fail to recognize is that these organizations, their manifestos and actions, were not merely emblematic of anti-democratic wolves at the door of US democracy, but in several important respects, occupants of the same room, the same space as democracy itself. So, um, Professor Hanchard, I actually wanted to ask you if you could share with us a little bit more what you mean when you label the relationship between our two key concepts, racism and fascism, a love story. Okay, so um, part of what I'm getting at is the fascism's reliance on myths and ideologies of racial hierarchy to justify exper imperial expansion, as well as internal racial orders. Italy's relationship to Ethiopia, um, Spain's relationship to Mo uh, Morocco, Germany's relationship to German Southwest Africa, Portugal and its relationship with African colonies, although Portugal is an outlier case in some ways because it wasn't a democratic polity when it descended into fascism. But all the others are examples of the belief in and practice of racial rule as precursors to fascism. Racial rule can exist without fascism. But I'm not sure fascism can be articulated without racial rule. This is something that Dagmar and I talked about uh, at length. Cleansing, replenishment, fears of pollution and contamination by ethno-national, racial, and religious inferiors was certainly part of the fascist playbook, with Germany as its most ardent emul emulator. Fascists feed from the trough of racial rule, and they love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so, Professor Herzog, I was thinking you might want to react to some of the things that Professor Hanscher just said, and then we'll just start a conversation. So, in turn, invite you to respond to Professor Herzog. Yeah, I just want to second the terrifying point that I think Theodore Adorno made, um, and then Enzo Traversa picked up on, uh, which is that the threat, I think Adorno said it in 1959 in his important essay, The Meaning of Working Through the Past, that the threat to uh, democracy from within democracy is infinitely more terrifying than the threat from outside against democracy, right? And I think that's what we're all very frightened about now. Um, I wanted to think some more about the question of a love story and also, um, is, is it possible to have a fascism without racism? Um, technically, 100 years ago now, right, Mussolini starts Italian fascism, and, and initially there are no anti-Jewish laws. Those come later, 1938, when Italy um, links up with Nazi Germany. And even more telling, I think, is the fact that Italians, officials and soldiers are in Italian Somaliland, they're in Eritrea, 
for there are thousands that are having long-term relationships, cohabitation, concubinage with women of color there and having shared babies with them. And those babies can become Italian citizens. And what is very, very striking is that then when uh, Italy decides to go into Ethiopia, wanting to declare the Italian empire, initially, literally access to the beautiful black women there is you know, dangled as the prize for the soldiers to go in. But within a year after the empire is declared, so in 36 is declared, in 37, suddenly you're watching racism being invented on the spot. So literally there is an ugly, ugly turn. Laws are passed that make long-term passionate love relationships between blacks and whites impossible. And are, they are prosecuted. And it's intense because affectless, Intercourse is okay, prostitution okay, but if you start to actually love the person and want to make babies with them, that's against the law. So it's really amazing that it just um, can happen so fast and get so ugly and be done through hideous sort of you know, negative sexualization in a way that wasn't there before. What's striking by contrast with Nazi Germany, and of course, when I think about love story, I think about the sexual politics of Nazism, which actually begins from negative sexualization of Jews. And that's a lot of how the Nazis managed to get the Christian churches, both Catholic and Protestant, on their side and make themselves seem like they're a moral movement is by claiming to be cleaning up the sexual dirt, supposedly, of Weimar, which is supposedly all Jewish-induced. And then the striking thing about Nazism is that it's actually anything but sexually repressive for non-disabled heterosexual Aryans, but of course that's the majority of the population. So in fact, Nazism is sexually inciting for the supposed master race. And the Nazis promised their own followers pleasure. They put themselves in the place of the Jewish sex rights activists that they've either driven into exile or killed. And meanwhile, uh, the Christian churches, in a sense, and it's actually Professor Kikandas' uh, colleague at Dartmouth, Susanna Heschel, who made the really perceptive point years ago that the Christians have an unrequited love for the Nazis. They help the Nazis into power. They give them a moral gloss. They eagerly want to be part of the power structure, precisely via this disgusting um, you know, assumption that sexual liberality is a Jewish enterprise that now needs to be combated. And then, of course, the Nazis turn on them, too. So I think that there's many ways in which we can think about the love story, and part of it is the ways in which fascism depends on racial rule, feeds from its trough. Um, there's a lot that racism does for fascism, provides scapegoats, um, gives people an inflated sense of self-esteem. It does a lot of stuff for it, right? Yeah. Um, but it's always different. That's what's actually really striking. The mix is always different. <clears throat> so when you said different, you mean from place to place, yeah. or site to site? From, yeah, no. from national setting to national yeah. setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I would agree. I would agree. I mean, I think um, what I was alluding to in the, in the Italian case is, I think it's Gentili and Mussolini's document, The Political Doctrine of Fascism, where they mention, in some sense, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia as an example of uh, the effort for Italy to restore its virility on the scene. So it's in some sense that juxtaposition of these, these African heathens in relation to the Italian superiors. And so it's in that sense that the articulation right, um, you know, brings forth this sort of dynamic relationships where the, 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 the other in some sense has to be summoned. Mm -hmm. Great. So I, one of my roles here is to... Um, slow the two of them down if things are going by too fast. Um, Professor Hatzar, could you just pause a little bit? Who are those Jewish sex researchers? That, what was that all about? All right. Uh, backing up a little bit into the 1920s. Um, so after Germany is defeated in World War I, um, the Weimar Republic is declared. And um, initially, it's run by socialists. And um, it's a time of enormous cultural experimentation and also a time of enormous economic crisis. And for um, both true and false reasons, Jews are strongly associated with sexual liberality. So on the one hand, there are prominent medical doctors and cultural figures who indeed advance you know, information about how contraception works. 
and wow, millions of Gentiles are really interested and would like to know how to <laughs> actually have sex without having babies. And it's enormously popular, precisely also in the Gentile population. But you know, it just happens to be um, Jewish medical doctors who are among the earliest sex rights activists, both for, um, again, this whole nexus has to do with homosexuality and abortion, which again turns us to the question of virility, masculinity, and so on. There's a link there. Um, there's something that bothers right-wing people. So um, the point is that Jews are active and, and prominent in sexual rights for minorities and in making a case that you know, many impoverished women desperately need access to termination of pregnancies. And all of that is then blown up into a grotesque, anti-Semitic uh, fantasy world in which Jewish men are the pimps that are violating Gentile maidens, and oh my God, this is all so dangerous, and Jews are damaging Germans and their sexuality, and all of that is already in the air all through the 1920s and into the early 30s, so that when the Nazis come to power, they claim that they will be cleaning up the so-called Jewish you know, sexual liberality of Weimar. But in fact, within about two years, the Christian churches, both Catholic and Protestant, are terribly disappointed because the Nazis themselves turn out to be pro-nudity, pro-pre- and extramarital heterosexuality. They're all about privileges and pleasure for the supposed master race. So speaking of the master race, um, Professor Hanchard, I, I was very surprised to learn recently that anti-miscegenation laws actually predate the founding even of the United States. Mm. And that once the United States was founded, um, anti-miscegenation laws were on the books of almost all states, only nine states mm. never enacted such laws. Could you share with us a little bit more about how that feeds into, is that part of the love story um, in terms of trying to control um, as Professor Herzog said, who gets to love whom? Yeah, well, there's a couple of things. I think that in response to the dogma, Professor Herzog, that there's a, that I think the fetishization of the other's bodies, particularly in this case, black women, whether we're talking about Ethiopia or the U.S. South, mm -hmm. um, can operate at the same time mm -hmm. within the context of racial rule. So yes. both those, both things, you can get right. both a phobia, fear and loathing, but also mm -hmm. that kind of undercurrent of desire operative mm -hmm. in both mm -hmm. time. I think the sort of, for me, the, the most ironic example is Strom Thurmond, who was the staunch segregationist from South Carolina, who apparently raped uh, one of uh, his domestic servants and produced a child that he never acknowledged. And it wasn't until she was, uh, in her 70s, I believe, that she made public that he was her father and basically supported her her whole life. So how do we make sense of the fact that this staunch segregationist and racist would have this, this daughter, desire her to be educated, and provide for her in his will, right? So that's where I, I think, you know, the kind of just, bizarre juxtapositions of fear and loathing. Michael Rogan used to be really good yeah. at this. He's somebody I miss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we can. Well, we I mean, can, I could say one more thing about that because, of course, it's in the 1660s that the Burgesses of Virginia decide yeah. that, um, although for many, many years Europeans have had um, citizenship flow through the fathers, you know, your, your, whoever your father is is, you know, what kind of rights you're going to have. Suddenly, they're deciding that. Um, the condition of slavery will be passed on through the mother. So, of course, um, all kinds of British uh, men in the colonies, had white men of various national origins, had both coercive and consensual sex with African-American women and then kept these mixed children as their own slaves often, right? So that the, the founders of the, you know, our country many of them were of that ilk. So that contradiction goes to the very heart of, yeah, it goes beyond lure and loathing combination. It's like deep yeah. in our country. Yeah. yeah, and other slave societies as well in the world. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Great, so um, there are so many topics we've opened up and we're going to be asking all of you what questions are the most on your mind. But I did wanna mention an area we haven't talked about um, that explicitly. It came up a little bit in your definitions, Professor Herzog, but I wanted to think a little more about economics of both racism and fascism, because it seems to me like an enormous amount of exploitation was going on, but we shouldn't necessarily equate it. Would, would you like to speak to um, what was in it for the people in charge? I mean, extortion of labor, right? I mean, honestly, right? I mean, that's the decision to shift away from an indentured servitude model to a slavery model and to construct a, a racial phantasmagoria around that that made that legal is about extortion of labor above all. Yeah, the production of a commodity by a commodity. Right. And I think if you're asking about, you know, one of the many ways that racism persists, of course, is the way it's totally entangled with class in the United States. And a, a lot of effort goes into preventing, what, you know, what we most need, which is a cross-color, you know, labor movement, right? Um, collaboration across the colors in order to have more economic justice. But um, that has been stymied over and over again, you know, first in the context of Reconstruction, and it's um, the destruction of Reconstruction, as it were. Then again, um, you know, around the time of the New Deal, and then again in the early 60s when there's a war on poverty, instead of a campaign for full employment, there's always ways in which, again, um, what could have been something addressing class injustice is turned into dividing black and white against each other. Yeah, there's a really interesting passage at the end of volume one of Marx's Capital, where he talks about the dawning age of the industrial uh, capitalism, and where he makes the comparison between the slave trade and the sort of travel down west coast of Africa with the abduction of children and impressing children into uh, working, for coercing them to work in the textile fa manufacturing business in England. His parallel is really, really clear that both of these forms of exploitation serve this new beast, the industrial, the, the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. One is done through slavery, enslavement. The other one is through kidnapping and coerced, coerced labor. And I think that's something that Dagmar and I were talking about earlier that, I mean, oftentimes, particularly with students sometimes, it's hard for students to get a sense that, you know, the source and the object of enslavement was not racism but exploitation. Right. right, and that's I think the important point that often gets 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 lost. Like people weren't enslaved because of the particular color of their skin, but but because they could they could be policed, they could be read. But the point was to extract value from them. Right. So the point is that slavery is not an arrangement of race relations, right? Exactly. I mean, right. <laughs> it's, exactly. about, it's exactly. about cotton and a lot of other exactly. commodities, right? Exactly. And then racism emerges and evolves and goes deep into people's thought processes and reflexes and feelings as a justification, right, over time. Yeah. It, that's, why, that's why it takes centuries because it evolves in those ways. But it becomes like a second nature. It becomes like a framework for seeing the world. I wanted to say, can I say one other thing about poverty? Because I want to say something about eugenics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, because, <laughs> because... Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, Just, can you give That's us fine. a quick definition of eugenics? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, um, yeah, so, if, so for the Nazis, of course, you have to think about eugenics and euthanasia. But so eugenics is about trying to control life, and euthanasia is about trying to control death but there are two different campaigns that are targeted against people who were deemed mentally disabled in some way, right? Cognitively disabled or mentally ill, or the term that psychiat German psychiatrists had invented at the turn of the 20th century, which was called psychopathic inferiority. Could be any one of us. It's basically like such a subjective loose category, um, but it gives the people an enorm medical doctors an enormous opportunity to um, deem people to be delinquent in some way or inappropriate in some way. It's at the border between psychic illness and so on. All of these people are targeted um, as are they worthy of reproducing? So eugenics is about the attempt to, it's of course it's an international movement, incredibly strong in the United States, in England, 
in Scandinavia. But there is a belief that it's mixed with white racism, but it is a belief that uh, only the healthy people should be reproducing and one should restrict people of color, Jews, depending on what country you're in and what your issues or shticks are, or in fact, as Germany was obsessed with the problem of imperfection within the folk. This is what's most striking to me. I, there's a standard story, everyone kind of knows that there were many uh, states in the United States in the early 20th century that passed you know, course of sterilization laws. Often it was people who were um, living in institutions for the feeble-minded, quote unquote, who were sterilized. But the numbers are nothing compared to what happened in Germany. And in Germany, it was really directed at the population as a whole. Um, a lot of what caused mental disability was poverty. I mean, there's a real link. I mean, 85%, 90 everyone knew this. It had to do with malnutrition and, you know, environmental hazards and disease and so many things that make it likely for people to be deemed feeble-minded. But what is so intense in Germany is that the racial hatred, Hass and Hass, directed against Jews and Roma and Sinti, the supposed outside of Germany, is matched by a racial fear and anxiety that the master race is not that great, that there's a problem there. And there's this unbelievable convulsive violence directed against purported imperfection within the folk. So the first um, racist law the Nazis passed is April of 1933. It's very interesting that it's the law for the restoration of the civil service. And what this is, is basically taking over the legal system in the, sense, in the government in the sense that they drive out all, quote, non-Aryans. They strikingly don't call them Jews because they don't, they're very concerned about international optics at that moment and they don't want to make it so specific, so they call it non-Aryans. And they also t throw out all anti-Nazis. They go after professors, teachers, notary publics, judges, but also every level of government. The second big racist law, and I would say that anti-disability animus counts as a form of racism, is July of 33, and it is the coercive sterilization law. And what is so striking about that law is that the experts know that the notion, it's law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring, they know, the science at that time knows that the vast majority of people deemed feeble-minded or whatever, no one knows what caused it, except for the things I said, poverty, disease, and so on. It's not like it's heredity. It's nonsense that it's heredity. But they decide to call it that because what it does, point number two, is it encourages, there's a compulsion to report. So there's like this classic fascist thing, which is the inducement to um, denounce social workers, special education teachers, charity institution directors, doctors, there were one million Germans were turned in by their fellow citizens as candidates for sterilization. That is what I mean about a convulsive going against imperfection within the folk. Of course, we have eugenics in the United States, yeah. and um, slavery was all about breeding as well and getting the strongest, most productive labor force you could have, right? What are some of the repercussions of that? How, how did it live on in American society? Well, I guess as a comparative, I, I, my, a lot of my examples are not from the US, but other places. Okay. Yeah, that, That'd be great. Yeah. yeah, and you know, one of the interesting things about the afterlife of eugenics was that it had a global resonance in different parts of the world. In Latin America, one of the interesting mm -hmm. things about the eugenicist discourses was that for many national elites and intellectuals in places like Argentina, Brazil, mm -hmm. Mexico, mm -hmm. they had come to the conclusion by the late 19th, early 20th century, well, if we believe in this eugenic stuff, it means that we're destined to be always inferior because mm -hmm. we just have you know, these negros, mestizos, and zambos, and all these people of so-called dusty hue. Mm -hmm. So we're always going to be a second-rate people. So we either have to do things, we either have to improve the population, Right, by encouraging certain kinds of breeding or subsidize uh, immigration. And so Argentina and Brazil in the late 19th century basically had a competition to see who could be the most European, which country could be the most European seeming country uh, in the world by through the subsidize, subsidizing uh, immigration from southern Italy and Spain. Mm -hmm. The problem was, and particularly in the case of Argentina and Brazil, 
often came a bunch of anarchists and communists and all these other people <laughs> came there and stirred, and stirred up trouble. So they weren't just, and then the, the, the irony was that in the United States, you know, certainly well into the 1920s, um, Italians were not necessarily considered white. I think the 1920 census, they, they were classified as mulatto. Right, so there's all this kind of indeterminacy mm -hmm. and this attempt to create this idea of a people, but it's still premised on a racial hierarchy. Now, one of the ironies of this is someone I, you know, who I've studied a lot, with Gilberto Freddi from Brazil, mm -hmm. was that he was referred to as a, a, a kind of revolutionary conservative, and he developed what could be characterized as positive miscegenation. He believed mm -hmm. that race mixing would actually create an inferior race of people in Brazil, as did Jose Vasconcelos, uh, who in Mexico, who incidentally, ironically, believed that the fusion between black, indigenous, and white would produce the cosmic race. And so he wrote a book, La Raza Cosmica. At the same time, he was eventually a member of the Nazi party. Right? So, so in some sense, there was no contradiction. But it was in a, in a way to kind of get out of this seeming paradox, right? to accept these, these larger logics, but taking an entirely different direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's really. Oops. Thank you. you. That's that's very very helpful. Did you want to respond briefly to? So, if I understand correctly, you're saying he believed that the mix of um, black and white and indigenous would actually be a superior. Uh, yes. Yeah. In, yes. In the case right. of Vasconcelos, right. and to some extent, for right. yeah, yeah, I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So that just makes me think about <laughs> Alfred Plutz. Who the hell is he? He's <laughs> 1895. He's the guy Hitler's reading when he's in prison. Oh, um, yes, 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 yes. But anyway, he's the guy who yes. brings racial hygiene. Right. He invents the term. Right. He, eugenics in Germany is called Rassenhygiene. Right. Um, and what is so striking about this book of 1895 is that he's the one who comes up with this notion that you know war and is contra selective, right? Because it kills the best yeah, and the brightest, yeah, and so on. Yeah. But he also has this notion that care is contra selective, right? So all those Christian charities that have thousands of disabled people in their institutions, they are because they're keeping these people alive and nurturing them. That is contra selective. That's what's damaging the German folk, right? He is in favor of killing disabled newborns. He has this fantasy that the old Spartans who used to you know, put their crippled or disabled children out on Mount Tagetos, he wants to reintroduce that. But he also has, you know, of course, this is so striking to me, like you're on page six of this very big book, and he's already talking about the other thing you can learn from the Spartans, which is about their pre and extramarital sex. It's all these gorgeous naked maidens and how fantastic the children are that they're going to be bearing. So it's an erotic charge about a dream of a folk that will be healthy, beautiful, and smart, right? If you, they only kill their cripples and do the right thing and have the right people breed, everything will be good. What's really interesting about him is that as of that book, 1895, he still thinks that mixing is great. Jews are great. Jews are wonderful at mixing. They've mixed all over the place, wherever they've gone in the world. And get this, Jesus, Spinoza, and Marx prove the Jews are great, <laughs> and that all that mixing was a plus. He changes his mind later on, right? But it shows you again that there's this cauldron of bizarro ideas that are floating around. And, you know, you can picture Adolf Hitler in his little cell reading this and getting all excited about the idea of the beautiful maidens and all the strong children, and then ultimately blending that with his nutcase paranoia about Jews. And the interesting thing, again, is just that Anti-Semitism didn't have to be. It didn't have to be the central thing. I'm always struck by how a new political conjunction creates a new hatred and then is made real by the laws that are passed and the propaganda that is disseminated. So I've got a zillion questions racing in my mind, but we really want to hear what's on your minds. So um, if you could just raise hands, and we do want you to speak in the mic because then it would be recorded, OK? And so you guys can. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. I have two questions. The first question is, Professor Herzog, did I understand you to say that um, mental illness may not be um, hereditary or genetically um, uh, coming about? And the other question is more a, a real basic question about the meaning of democracy. I mean, when the country was formed, there was concern among 
the founders, if you will, in the Federalist Papers about how to deal with the issue of democracy and how to balance that with majority rule, individual rights, and we got a whole host of uh, Bill of Rights to deal with the individual right, which may be going against the rule of the majority, which most people define as a democracy. Um, bringing us to the present case, most people have looked to the courts as that place under the Constitution to go against the will of the majority and to protect the individual rights. We can look at how the courts evolved and addressed the issue of the problems of the day. Uh, that, of course, was recently taken away when the abortion ruling came down. Those people th that are in favor of the restrictions against abortion use that word democracy, again, to justify what they're doing. A and that brings us to the, the fundamental issue is what is a democracy? Because they're claiming that by bringing the abortion back to the state legislatures, that's bringing it closer to the people, and that's what democracy is all about. So I'm curious as to what the panelists has to think about this idea of democracy and how we put that into play when that concept can be used, obviously, for the repression of what traditionally has been individual rights that they've looked to the courts to protect, and when the courts, of course, aren't really going there anymore. I find it interesting that uh, the Steve Bannons of the contemporary world now often refer to the United States not as a democracy, but as a republic. And in some sense, they're partially right, because what we have now in the United States is very different from, let's say, the, the Athenian prototypes, which pre presuppose direct democracy, not, not representative democracy. Many of the features of the US political culture that the average person associates with democracy is actually features of republicanism and liberalism, not democracy uh, proper. Um, I should so say. I, I guess my, if I may, no, sure, go ahead. My, my, my final question is that the argument, and I just was wanting to get your response, is sure. that those people that were preserving individual rights, those nine members of the Supreme Court, are not elected. And so they're most removed, quote, from the true democratic right. principles right. because they sit in Washington, D.C., and they're not even elected, and they go through a juxtaposition of this republic notion where senators do this, and the argument is now that let's return it to the states, and those people that make up the state legislature are the most representative, if you will, of the people that can vote locally in their local elections. And so that sort of is it, what I'm trying to understand from your point of view, is how do you sort of reconcile that when that argument is, we'll just return all that stuff that used to protect individual liberties back to those people that are, quote, on the ground, right. and thereby we have yeah. this erosion of right. individual rights. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a very, you know, a perversely intelligent strategy on the part of the arch Republicans, in some sense, to part of this move to remand many decisions to states is in some ways to deprive the central state, st centralized state authority and power any dominion over the territory, right? Um, and so this, in some sense, goes back, in some sense, the old language about state, states' rights during, during, during Jim Crow. And I think, in some ways, this is a, just a sort of revisiting this, right? But it was even when, when we think about, um, you know, during Obama's term in office, the first term, and Jim Boehner, when he was speaker, and this was, I think, the first time when the, go the uh, federal government in D.C. shut down, and Boehner was asked, how did he see you know, the, the, the Kind of moving past, get, getting past the impact, and he said he would rather that the government not function than to accede to or to acknowledge any victories associated with, with, with Obama. So you get, in some sense, this, this 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 idea of sort of blackness associated with state dysfunction, right? And this is where I think some of this language now about taking the country back it all harkens back to debates that were really at the end of the Civil War. Um, I, I think it's really important not to take them at their word. So when they say we're returning this to the states, right. that was a strategy. It worked. It was a fig leaf that allowed the Supreme Court to make the decision it wanted to make already. But now, of course, there are many, many militant activists who at every state level are actually going to try to make um, 
termination of pregnancy is illegal all across the United States, right? So this oscillation between going after the federal and going after the state is part of the technique, if that makes any sense. And of course, when it comes to gun control, right, um, then suddenly the state's rights don't matter as much, right? So it, it uh, just, right. you know, you just, <laughs> it's not like, it's not like pointing that out changes anything. It's just like, they don't care. They love it that they're brazenly getting away with um, all these different techniques and all these different strategies, right? It just keeps decent people on their toes and terrified. Um, I want to say something briefly. You're making a very good point. Of course, uh, there is a genetic component to schizophrenia, for example, right? And of course, there is a phenomenon of not severe cognitive disability, but sort of in between a little bit, like deeply associated with growing up in conditions of malnutrition, poverty, environmental hazard disease, lack of cultural assistance or whatever, that can look like it's being transmitted biologically. The biological element is actually the disease and the poverty, and the, right? That's a bio, but, but it looks as though it's being passed on through right. generations. Right. You see the medical doctors and the special ed teachers who should know better doing a kind of poverty pornography, like describing all these disgusting dwellings that the poor live in, and insisting that this is a her hereditary thing. But of course, it's epigenetic, right? It's a mixture of environment and, and biology. But um, the point is that rather than trying to do something to alleviate, mitigate poverty, which would be the best way to reduce the number of people who are having significant problems, they try to turn everything into heredity and biology. And there is a theory that they acquire from a French psychiatrist who acted as though you could... Um, if you have a genealogical chart of an extended family and you have like one great aunt and she has had a mental illness and then somebody over here had manic depression and then somebody here turned out to be a little feeble-minded, oh, that shows you it's hereditary. See, now we're going to sterilize them. So they did the broadest possible um, anything that could remotely be a bit of proof that something was inborn makes you a target for sterilization, if that makes any sense, right? And And there's endless efforts then to try to talk about recessive genes and to come up with the scientific explanation, but they know. They know that in most cases they cannot prove. They just presume it, and then they do it. Great. So we have a lot of younger people in the audience. I was wondering if um, someone would like... Great. Thank you. Right here. Thank you. Hi. Um, okay, so I wanted to backtrack a little bit and talk about more of the uh, relationship between fascism and sexual violence and racism. Mm -hmm. So I think we know that, you know, fascism can often lead to war. War is often, you know, contains a lot of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And we looked a little bit at the Ethiopian, Ethiopian example where mm -hmm. sexual violence um, led to a sort of hatred of race. I wonder if there are cases where sexual violence is actually part of a race-making project or as a way to, like, convert somebody's right. racial association. I don't know if either one of you want to speak to that. Right. I mean, um, so sexual violence in war is often a weapon of war, right? right? But it really depends on what the racial mindset is of the people doing it, whether they're um, going to treat the babies that are made as they're mine, you know, they belong to us now, or whether they're going to kill those people, right? So th that's why I think it's very important to distinguish between exclusionary exterminatory racism and hierarchical racism, right? So in a lot of colonial settings, um, for 600 years, Europeans are in various places around the globe, right? Whether in Latin America or Asia or Africa, whatever. And then it, it's normal for the European men to be partnered with the women there. And those women have a lot of agency. That isn't necessarily as one book put it, 600 years of rape. I mean, it is, there are lots and lots of arrangements that are reciprocal. Um, it only over time, as there is a growing class of mixed people, and as, oh wait, white supremacy, white privilege, the prestige of Europeans in the colonies, it was, as that becomes threatened by a larger group of mixed peoples, and, and you can watch the rhythms of rule happening all around the globe it, in a syncopated way, then suddenly 
racisms are getting invented, right? And new ideas about how to create boundaries and new hysteria about mixing and a lot of shipping of white women into the colonies happens and a lot more brutality in terms of labor management. All these other things come in their wake. So you asked about war. There are, if you think about the Armenian genocide, right, there are definitely some people who were able to survive by being married in, as it were. If you think about the wars in the former, um, you know, Yugoslavia and Bosnia, right, Serbia, then there's, yeah. there's some, sometimes there's a, a, a taking of the babies and the people, and, and sometimes it's really just to force people to flee, right? So it, it really varies in terms of different situations. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so th there's other examples, too, to think about. And so I'm thinking about uh, Japanese imperialism and the subjugation of, of, of Korean women, yeah. right? And, and at a time when the Japanese fascist state monarchy considered the Japanese the Aryans of the East, and so they used a lot of the same language and justice story to, to, to engage in rape and other forms of sexual defilement. Um, thinking also of, uh, this, you'd know more about this than I do, but certainly, what, what was known either alternative to the Rhineland bastards yeah. or the horrors of the Rhineland, right? And the sterilization policies right. that, that followed there. Um, yeah, um, Eugene Fisher, where does Eugene Fisher fit in all this? The anthropologist? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he was in German, German Southwest Africa, yes, right? Yes, he was. He was chief yes. medical officer? Yeah, he was right. an anthropologist. Right. He was collecting skull specimens, so yeah. he was interested in uh, learning about supposedly the idea that there were different races, even right. though there weren't. But they're creating this idea that it's real in these gazillion yeah. different ways. I don't know if that's satisfying you in the ways that, you know, I mean, we can talk about sexual violence in the Holocaust if that's one of the things you're asking about. I mean, I don't know. But I mean, that it, it, I think that for years, um, um, we, in American popular culture, we were sort of misled and thought a lot about sort of prostitution within concentration camps, but really the vast majority of sexual violence happens in the killing fields, and it's women who are later murdered, if that makes any sense, right? Um, and yeah, it's, it's been something, it's something that was information that was suppressed for about 50 years, but there are amazing German scholars that have written about that right now. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think um, one thing I've thought about in like my own kind of research and interests and in, in this presentation in, in particular is this idea of how racism and fascism rely on so many contradictions. Yeah. Um, and so I guess my question is, how can the idea of eugenics, of restricting and controlling reproduction coexist with the economics of fascism and racism? in which like, the commodification of human life implicates this increased um, reproduction amongst targeted groups, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm, not, I'm not quite following. You might have seen it. Yeah, it's so, my fault. yeah. so I guess like, with the idea of, of eugenics, there's this idea of restricting reproduction. And this also kind of coexists within fascism. And at the same time, fascism also relies on this like, commodification of labor, right. um, which I, I've found implicates the kind of reproduction of groups that are targeted. So I guess like how do fascist nations, fascist governments kind of justify that kind of like eugenic side of things alongside this, this need for the commodification of labor, if that makes sense? I mean, there's two little things. I mean, one of the points is, of course, um, we all think of the Nazis as pronatalist, you know, you know, mothers cross and, you know, these women in their dirndls with their blonde braids around their head and so on, and how, how awesome that they're having seven children, blah, blah. But it's really, it's also an antinatalist system, right? And um, Gisela Bach, the feminist historian, who is the one who's done did in the 80s the most amazing research on the course of sterilization, she's the one who always made the point that this is both sexist racism and racist sexism, and that, in fact, the, it's, it's like two sides of the same coin in terms of um, denying so-called superior women access to contraception and abortion, right? At some point, even that there's a death penalty on abortion. They're supposed to be making babies, right? Whereas all these other women are not allowed to be, right? So those, that's definitely, the, the two sides of the same coin is really important. Um, I would, I think it's really good that you're asking the question about economics. 
because one of the really intense things that's happened in the last few years, like last decade or so, is um, to shift away from eugenics for a moment to euthanasia, the mass murder of individuals with disabilities. So if the majority of those who were sterilized were deemed feeble-minded, um, cognitively disabled, the vast majority, the largest group of those who were murdered had the label of schizophrenia which of course is a huge umbrella category, and there were many of them were institutionalized, that they were sitting ducks for the Nazis who wanted to kill them. But ultimately, <coughs> they've, after the fall of the wall, um, their uh, so old sources from the Stasi had been hiding and holding on to were found, and um, 30,000 of the um, T4, the, the gas chamber killings of the disabled, the, their patient records were found. And um, a group of people did a multi-year, multi-factorial study of 3,000 of these. And what they figured out is that although it was such an enormous achievement to get the persecution of the disabled acknowledged as a form of racism, in point of fact, what caused people to be like, live or die is whether they could work or not. Okay, so this was like totally shaking to people because they'd worked so hard to get, you know, ableism, anti-disability animus counted as racism, and suddenly it's like, oh, actually nonsense about whether something was racially hygienic, or hereditary, or whatever. It was absolutely, if somebody was able to work, they probably lived, and if they couldn't, they were probably killed. Yeah, one of the, yeah, one of the points that Professor Hertzog and I talked about earlier is that perhaps one of the distinctions and this gets to the material component between racial rule uh, and racial rule under fascism is that one of, is, is the role of labor, where if you think about German Southwest Africa, if you think about the camps, uh, Buchenwald and others, um, there was the fetishization and the use of basically useless labor, right? You were basically working people to death. Um, under conditions of enslavement, um, throughout the Americas, not just the U.S., um, there was an emphasis on productive labor, even if, in many c circumstances, that productive labor, slaves would work so hard they could not reproduce their own populations, and that's why places like Brazil and Cuba had to continue to import slaves well into the late, uh, the late 19th century. But I think that's one of the kinds of distinctions, because you find it both in German Southwest Africa and in the German, um, the German case. Um, the person who has done a really subtle job, I think, and also a very accessible book, which is on the which is on the syllabus, is James Whitman's uh, Hitler's American Model, and um, you know he talks about a couple of things. And one of the things he talks about is in terms of German jurisprudence and scholarship, focusing on these American laws, was that the German lawyers were not really preoccupied with Jim Crow and apartheid. Right, and so that's that's one fundamental just because they were they were they were uh, concerned with the decimation or the obliteration of a population, not a kind of coexistence of a population. So in some sense, the the, the preoccupation with eugenics, eugenics, and you can, Professor Hurkacz can tell me if I'm wrong, but my sense of the German case is the preoccupation with eugenics was in part to help discern who was and who was not a Jew. Right, rather than, well, it could be connected to improving the race by obviously obliterating certain populations, but that's very different from, say, the New World cases where you have all these traces of racial hierarchy and fetishism, but in the belief somehow that these people can still be productive citizens for our nation. Right? They just happen to look a little bit differently from us. Right, that would be more, that would be more comparable in the Nazi case with the Slavs. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So that would be the. Nazi occupied Eastern territories of Poland and the yeah, Soviet yeah. Union. I mean, there is this idea that the Slavic peoples can be, you know, sterilized, kept alive, yeah. doing extort, you know, extorted labor, mm -hmm. whereas Jews, they are supposed to be exterminated root and branch, right? Great. So I had a feeling this would go by really fast, um, and it has. And I wanted to give each of our speakers a chance to just um, either pick up on a point that we actually didn't get to at all. There were are so many topics that are related to this big umbrella topic, um, or if you want to um, comment on something that has been said. So, um, Professor Hanchard, would that would you like to start, or some uh, points yeah, maybe we didn't get points. to? Yeah, a yeah points great. Points I didn't get to. I'll just do one for the sake of time. Um, uh, for the sake of time, sorry. Um, this actually comes from my most recent book, *The Specter of Race*. 
how discrimination haunts Western democracy. And I think, in, particularly in contemporary academic discussions about the threats to democracy, many discussions of democracy focus on institutions and procedures. What I focused on instead to complement that discussion, but also to sort of poke holes in it, is that we pay attention to the ethnos of democracy, the ethnos of democracy, that actually existing democracies have utilized formal rules, laws, and as well as informal mechanisms to favor one or more populations within a polity. And it brings us back, in most cases, to a, basically, to a basic question that shows up in our discussion here. By what criteria shall we determine who shall and who shall not become a citizen? Thank you so much. Professor Hatzard? Um, I already told Professor Hanshard and Kikandas that I really wanted to tell you all this one anecdote, so I'm going to do it. Um, so Stuart Hall, um, Jamaican-born, Afro-British sociologist, brilliant cultural critic. In the 90s, he was at Harvard giving a triptych of lectures, and I'm I'm sorry to my students who probably heard this before because I just think this is the most intense little thing. Anyway, he said, so <clears throat> if race is a social construct, why does racism persist? <laughs> okay, answer, because race is a social construct. <clears throat> In other words, if white people really were superior to brown or black people, right, uh, there would be nothing that needed to be talked about or acted on or secured through laws or systemic deprivation. It would be like saying the sky is blue and the grass is green. It's nothing to discuss. But precisely because it is a lie, because race is a fiction, that's why it gets endlessly restated and redebated and reenacted and performed every single day. Or, and I urge all of you to watch the new um, PBS documentary, U.S. and the Holocaust, that Professor Kikandis already mentioned. I have a new hero, Emmanuel Seller, yes, who was yes. a part Catholic, part Jewish congressperson from New York. And in 1924, he's protesting in, in the U.S. Congress the Immigration Act. And he says, it's bunk and balderdash. There is no such thing as superior and inferior peoples. There's just one human race. Great, so um, I know we'll want to thank our two speakers again, but just a couple of brief reminders. Um, one is that we have a session on May 10th right here in person, and please look at the 1014 website for two um, sessions that will be scheduled um, and online, so you can attend wherever you are. And also, um, I believe we're all invited to have um, a drink and some snacks. It's just on the same floor across the way, and we really hope you will stay and chat with each other, chat with our speakers, um, and uh, certainly let me know what other topics are on your mind. But um, could we please have another a huge round of applause for...